Our guest in this segment, Senator Eric Tarr, finance chair in uh, the uh, West Virginia Senate. Good morning, Senator Tarr. How are you? Yeah, doing great, Rob. How are you this morning? Good, thank you. I don't know your age, but did you ever watch the Dukes of Hazard when you were younger <laughs> or, or reruns? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> I, I was I was thinking about that. So if you're running shine, and it gets it's one. I had my questions were I'm trying to think. Okay, now I know we we talked about at some point of making so much moonshine. So it's still a felony to run moonshine, uh -huh. and then second. Is at what speed is it? Does it become a felony? So, I, so I'm, I'm I'm reasoning through the things here. Hey, I, well, did, <laughs> Senator, did you ever have the exploding dynamite? <laughs> you know, I, I've uh, I never found the, that. Uh, the exploding dynamite? No, no, I, I I've not had that on the end of a bow and arrow by any means. But uh, <laughs> well, you know, that's what I meant. The, the exploding arrow that was like a stick of dynamite that was unbelievable. I've never seen that in real life. Yeah, me neither. And you know, I've got enough of an arsenal. I don't don't need the bow and arrow of dynamite. <laughs> it just adds to the collection. That's all. You know, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, you know, we need to have on a wall. Yeah, uh, is is moonshine uh, illegal? You it can, was just can, made. It was just made legal. We can now make moonshine as of July first. I believe we can now cook our own. Yeah, yeah. The, it's uh, got a bit of a volume restriction on it, but yeah, you yeah. can make it for personal use. So um, now running across the state line, though, I don't know how that, how that works that way. I guess if you're coming in from Maryland or Virginia or somewhere into West Virginia with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you're in trouble if you try to sell it to your neighbor. Yeah. Oh yeah. I yeah. I don't think you can sell it. It's personal use. And then so, but if you're, is it legal in Virginia and Maryland? So if say, say you had the felony over in one of those States and you drive over into West Virginia where it's not a felony, can they still pursue you? Does it still count once you're across the state line? I don't know. If I, only we had a prosecutor yeah. in the room who could answer that question. <laughs> Harvey, Harvey stays quiet on it. He's very careful I'm not giving Matt. You got yeah, Well, yeah, because I want people to say, well, I was losing the radio, and he said, you could do this. Well, anything Matt says is strictly in pleasure oh, mode my. right now. These are not work-related yeah, quotes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's all fun I stuff. I want, that same, I want that same liberty. Mm -hmm. Senator Tarr, so uh, <laughs> to business now with these tax cuts that have been proposed, the triggering mechanism that was put in place uh, last year, I guess it was, says uh, possibly 3 to 4% may take place this year, but the governor said add another 5% to that. I'm going to call you folks back in to get it done. We had the governor on last week, very much in favor of getting this 8 or 9% tax cut through. Uh, you say, it, hold on, uh, we might not have the funds for this. Why do you say that? Yeah, one of the things we have to do is you have to look at because of the way we set the tax cut up, the, set, the tax cut is set to give as max a tax cut as we can relative to the economic growth of West Virginia without getting us into a deficit so that we would have to go in and raise another tax somewhere else or to go in and do uh, a major spending reduction uh, by the force of it. And by that, it, it, it makes us control the growth of our budget because if it triggers a tax reduction, you automatically are start looking, okay, well, we can't grow government spending past that tax reduction. So I'm all for tax reductions. You know, it's, I've um, um, been the guy who's went out and championed several different bills out here for, for reducing taxes, whether it was personal property tax or whether it was the 50% income tax reduction that we did that uh, you know, it was got voted down the House before we got to this compromise bill, which was a 21 and a quarter. So, and the triggers are there to trigger that income tax down all the way to zero over time relative to that economic growth. So, we're going to see that that's the, the right about the three to four percent. That's about a $90 million tax cut. We've already uh, have two other tax cuts that are kicking in for this year as well. Uh, we eliminated the, the tax on soft drinks, and that's about a $14 million revenue that comes in. We also are phasing out, accelerating the income tax reduction on Social Security income. That was about a $38 million ticket. This year, it'll be about $10 million of that $38 million. So on top of the 88 ish let's call it 90 for easy math, that you'd get from the trigger, we also still have another 24 on top of that. So you're at $114 million tax reduction stepping in before we pass anything else. And if you go in and do an, another... 5%, you're talking another $100 million, 110, somewhere in that neighborhood on top of it. And that's, you're getting into some real pocket change by the time you start doing that. So I'm okay with doing that as long as we don't put ourselves in a position that hampers our economic growth. And that's one of the things we've been really good about, at least I think, I guess I'm, I'm, I can be biased here because I've kind of been in the, the cooking chamber up here. 
that what we've been real good about is controlling spending and getting tax reductions because we have reduced taxes north of a billion dollars since 2015. So there's, I'll make no mistake, I'm for tax cuts. But what has to happen now because of this triggering, triggering mechanism, we either, if you're going to go in and reduce the taxes, we need to find some place we're going to reduce the spending, or we've got to find another tax to make up for it, or a combination of the two. And so that's a discussion that's always worth having. What I what I objected to more than anything is just the, the the way the governor usually does this stuff. He'll go up. He doesn't consult us at all. There's no heads up. There's no planning. It's just we're going to drop a bomb on you. Well, most of the stuff we've done has been years in development in planning on how we're going to do the economic development. How are we going to do the tax cuts? How are we going to get government uh, shrunk enough that we can control the spending? That takes planning, and it's usually not a couple-week process to do that. So um, when you're, especially when you're talking those size numbers and getting 134 people to try to figure out, you know, understand what they're voting on. So it's, um, I think it's something that we're definitely would be talking about. I think that you can't talk about that tax cut without talking about the other stuff, which gets politically difficult. You mentioned the tax reductions that are in place and will be in place next year that will reduce revenue. What about the financial obligations of the state that will increase next year? What are we on the line for automatically that at this point is too late to turn back? There's about $325 million automatically kicks in. And this, this is something else that you know, when the governor did his presentation that he was using a little bit of funny math. As he said, we have an $860 million surplus. Well, we had an $860 million surplus until he raised the revenue estimate in order to go in for us to do some fixes in this last special session. And that reduced that surplus amount because the revenue estimate changed to $526 million. So there's about $526 million of cushion relative to what the state's operating budget is now. But already on the books, we have a little north of $325 million that is going to be additional spending that's already statutory. Um, it's a very it's a sundry of things uh, from hope scholarship to teachers aides in classrooms um, to corrections salaries um, on a formula there that we we have to go back and redress um, PIA changes there's there's a lot of things in there that really start adding up quick and those are the ones I can think of off the top of my head so if you take out that say 325 the 525 is 200 million dollars left you take another hundred million out in revenue. That $100 million cushion on a $20 billion operating budget makes me a little uneasy. Um, so we uh, just need to look at how we go in and sustain our economic growth because we still have to be competitive as a state, not just by our regulations, but also by the ability to put infrastructure down, get our roads down, bridges down, sewer, water, broadband, all that stuff's necessary to continue this economic growth at West Virginia scene. And, and that takes a bit of a cushion to be able to move on the fly at times. Did that 300 uh, plus million include a 5% raise for state employees next year, Senator Tarr? Or would no, that be an addition? Not. So that would be an, an addition, addition to. And yep. how, how much Correct. does a 5% raise for state employees cost? I believe it was right at about 120, 25 million somewhere. So that's, that's your entire $100 million cushion right there. There you go. Yeah. And those are the things that, you know, as, as you start going through and, and you, to start doing the budgeting for the next session, um, what's changed a lot, and I think I might have talked on your show about this last time, I can't recall, I said it in a lot of different places, what's changed in how West Virginia budgets as compared to how we used to and how most states do it is typically what would happen is the governor would come in with one revenue estimate, and then the, the legislature spends to that revenue estimate. What we've been doing differently is that one is that the governor comes in and has given us two revenue estimates. One is a revenue estimate of what he thinks it takes for a base budget. And then this is about how much we think we'll have in surplus having held that base budget. The governor's been looking at it from that way. This last session, there was a fundamental change in what we did. And really that fundamental change came because of the governor's state of the state address when he just wanted to spend everything that was left. And what the legislature did is we, we went back and worked off the previous year's budget and said, okay, what spending growth is required, what's not required, and what can we reduce relative to last year's budget? And that's where we're going to set the budget at. 
And then whatever comes after that is going to be surplus. And then we're going to figure out what can we do with that surplus? Can or is it tax reductions? Is it going to be? And you got to realize too that when you're looking at surplus, in my head, it's always one-time dollars. So if you're going to do a tax reduction with it, how are you going to do a perpetual tax reduction with one-time dollars? And that's that's tricky. So that's things I try to avoid is is that a repetitive spend off of money you're only going to see one time. And then you look at where can we go in and um, spend money that makes the state money, or where can we go in and spend money that saves the state money going forward so there's less demand on taxpayers. Um, and we've been doing that really well. Um, and I think if you know if anybody took a drive this morning, my guess is somewhere along your drive you were on new asphalt. Now there was some place you're probably complaining about too, but I mean how it wasn't long ago if you went out and took that drive. You couldn't say that you drove on new asphalt somewhere. Well, that's because we've been taking some of the surplus dollars and adding to the state road fund to be able to get roads paved. Um, and that's that's been hundreds of millions of dollars. And there's still a lot more to do, as everybody knows. So there's there's a lot of things out there that has been planned for years and years and years. We've been done forecasts that are holding pretty true to that plan. And so when you step out at really big figures, you risk the whole plan when we're still in our infancy of, uh, of this economic growth. John Gilstrap. So is what I'm hearing is that the, the governor's plan for the additional 5% is sort of DOA? Um, I don't, I, I, he didn't have a plan. That's the issue. So um, if, if there was a plan, I could give a better answer to that. But just to come out and say, you know, do another 5%, that, that's not really a plan. That's, that's a hope. That's an idea. Um, and like I said, I, you know, I have those hopes and ideas for those tax reductions as well. Um, right now we're at 21 and a quarter. You're going to see probably another 4%. So you're, you're getting up 25 and a quarter percent. And then, um, if we went in and did the other, and then you're getting up to close to 30% of a tax cut, um, that's all coming on top of the stuff we already accelerated. That starts making me nervous relative to the pace of West Virginia's economic growth. Do you... Um, do your fellow senators and and delegates feel the same way, or are they do you anticipate it? Do the you anticipate reaction, restraint being the harder sell than the the make it happen? Here's what I expect, um, and this is being pretty blunt. But w what typically happens is the the Senate will be kind of reserved on these things. Um, we sit back, and, and it was the process was designed this way. You know that when the the House is kind of the for the passion of the day, and the Senate's for the cooling dish of the passion of the day. And that's that's a George Washington quote. So it's, um, it's and it still works that way. So what'll happen is is you'll have a lot of people over on the House side that say we want the tax cuts, we want the tax cuts, we want the tax cuts. By golly, they'll go and vote for the tax cuts, but they'll also at the same time send the finance committees spending bills that exceed our state budget, the revenue estimate um, by a lot. So you can't have both. Now you can reduce spending. And you can have tax cuts, you can have economic growth, and you can have tax cuts, but you can have spending growth that outpaces economic growth and then tax cuts that outpace economic growth. And so that's where the politics really come into play um, at intensely up under the dome. So what I think is that we'll have the discussion. It wouldn't surprise me if we see a, a bill that comes across and says uh, an additional 5%. I think what you'll see the Senate looking at is how do we responsibly afford it do we want it? Yes, we would want it. And is this the time to do it? Because eventually we're getting there anyway. We will absolutely, with the plan we have right now, we are getting there anyway. If we screw up with modifying and playing with what we've done, we won't. And so that's, that's what's at risk. Um, I believe that West Virginia in the, probably the next 8 to 10 years is going to see the income tax go away. We would be the second state in the history of the country to eliminate our income tax. It's no easy lift. The only state that's ever eliminated their income tax is Alaska. Alaska did it off oil. And, the, and they had a major tribulation after they did it because they did it wrong the first time. But the other eight states that have no income tax, it's constitutional for them. They never had an income tax. So it's a big lift, and you, you know I, we want to get it right. And so it's, for me, planning is the key word. Uh, I want to be able to make a forecast, know that I'm within a certain area of range, for where it's going to land to make those kind of decisions when you're talking about what ends up being 
about two point two to two point four billion dollar tax cut by the time it's all said and done. Senator Tarr, um so going back to the pop tax, this is just kind of a process question. That was fourteen million dollars, but that was a tax that was on soft drinks or sugary drinks, whatever whatever it was. And but that was earmarked to go directly to the medical schools. So how do how do the medical schools get made whole on that fourteen million dollars? It's on the insurance premium. So there's um, there's a tax that comes into the state that's the insurance premium tax, um, and that typically would go to general revenue. It's not earmarked for anything. And this was a this was a pretty big negotiation because it was a big leap of faith uh, for the medical schools to trust the legislature to go in and make them whole, make them whole relative to a tax they've been receiving since the 1950s. And this, this is one of the things that, you know, is difficult to is every time, I, you know, it's really hard to get rid of a tax. That tax that was added in the 1950s was supposed to be a temporary tax. Um, so if you call um, 70 years temporary, then, then I guess it is. So what, but what the problem that caused is I think we were the last state in the country that still had that tax. And so that created a lot of resentment in the industry that manufactures and sells sugary drinks. And so we had a hard time drawing that industry into West Virginia. Just the effort, just the effort got us phone calls from, you know, the Cokes and the Pepsis of the world come in and saying, hey, we're interested in West Virginia. And and we've seen them, since we've eliminated that tax, come in and prop up new facilities in West Virginia already, big facilities. Um, So it was a, a very much a hindrance to to job creation in that industry and for West Virginia, because within that industry, we were resented. We were, we were the outlier big time. And so going in and demonstrating that opportunity to the medical schools, uh, making them, um, or not making them, but helping them to see that the, how we would move those numbers around so that the schools are still supported, um, was a big deal. And there's a lot of trust. And so I really appreciate them actually working with us on it. There's going to be a new administration next year. How how do you anticipate the the budgeting process will be uh, come January 2025? I think that we're probably going to have a better idea with this incoming governor of what to expect with the governor's side of the budget. You know, from what I just explained on how we did it this past year, uh, I've had a lot of conversations with uh, Patrick Morsey. Uh, I think that anybody you talk to that pays attention to uh, polling and voters in West Virginia would say that Patrick's going to be the next governor. Um, and I'm excited about that. It, it's really, you know, in my eyes, we finally have a Republican governor. And it would be the first time since I've served up here that I get to do that. <laughs> and in that scenario, I think what you're going to see is a, is a lot more open communication directly with the governor ahead of the session to get a plan ready and then – work those numbers around that plan, and then implement it. And if you get that kind of cooperation, you can get a session's worth of work done in a week. And so I'm excited about that, and that's kind of, that's what I'm expecting. Senator, you opened the door, so I'm going to walk through it. In fact, I'm going to barge through it. All right, with your comment right there, it would be the first time you've had the chance to work with a Republican governor. Obviously, Jim Justice switched his party affiliation midway through his first term and served his entire last term as Republican governor. There's clearly a rivalry between the two of you, what is the basis for that rivalry? When did it start? And have the, I've asked, I asked the governor the same question last week when he was on the show. Have the two of you ever sat down to try to work out your differences? Honesty and integrity. Um, the, those are the big things. Um, and, and that starts right off when you're selling yourself as one thing, and then you immediately change what that is when it suits you for a power play. Um, and that, that started early in his governance. Um, and, I'll, and I'll give you an example. And so, and I've tried, uh, guys, I have tried, I've tried, I've tried to, 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 to get to where I'm okay with some of this stuff. And it's, it's difficult. You know, Governor Justice ran as the business guy. He still says he's the business guy. He comes in and he's going, he's going to make the state right for business. In his very first state of the state, he comes in, he wants to raise taxes. You know, we, we were in a terrible situation in West Virginia of a deficit of about 10%. And by his second state of the state, he's wanting to raise taxes by $450 million, which was 10% of the state's budget. And when the legislature went in and said no, 
he comes in, takes that budget, puts a silver platter of bull crap, literal bull crap, in the dome on that, that spending control. And now he claims credit for where we are. So claiming credit, okay, I, I can take that. That's politics. But the reality is it's, it wasn't because of him at all. He actually opposed it. So then when it suited him for a power position because the way the state was going, he switches from Democrat to Republican and party. But then he comes out, meets with us as a party, and still says he's going to support Joe Manchin. And that's been evident by a lot of people that are still in and out of that Capitol Dome. So it's just, it's just not being genuine with the people of West Virginia. And I think anybody that knows me knows that I'm pretty straightforward. I, I, don't, I don't BS. Um, I don't think the people of West Virginia deserve that, and that's what they've been getting from a governor. That's the problems I have. We have about two minutes left, uh, Senator. He mentioned that you may have been responsible for Senator Blair's defeat. I didn't get a chance to ask him what he meant by that. Can you interpret that in any way? <laughs> no, I'm certainly not responsible for that defeat. I'm uh, Senator Blair, and you guys have heard me say on there, his biggest fan. Um, I, it blows my mind that that Senate district up there sent one of the best Senate presidents I've seen up here packing home. Um, it, it blows my mind. So, so much of what's happened right now has, for this economic growth, has been led from the Senate. Sometimes it ends up with a House bill number on it because they end up going switching it over. But so much of these ideas and concepts have been led from the Senate, and they've been led by Senate President Craig Blair. Um, you know, I, I did everything I could to help uh, President Blair get that seat when, when he was appointed to it. It's been an honor to be his finance chairman, and uh, I did everything I could to, to see that he was going to be back in that seat. But the responsibility of that, I think, was a lot of um, the selling that came from that uh, Stand for Us pack when they dropped $400,000 in two weeks into that campaign, and nobody saw it coming from that out-of-state pack. And they're a big pharma pack. So they come in say, you know, saying that uh, Craig Blair's pro-transgender stuff, which is the furthest thing from the truth, and then, but what they really are is a big pharma pack that was mad about legislation that West Virginia has passed to make pharmaceuticals affordable in West Virginia. On that note, I thank you for your time this morning. Much appreciated, as always. Uh, great information about the budget and some uh, insight there as well. I'm going to send you out with the Dukes of Hazard theme we talked about earlier, Eric. Okay? Oh, I love it. <laughs> See you guys later. <laughs> Have a Take great care. day.